Hi! In this lecture, we started to discuss the idea of automated software testing and then test-driven development. And TDD, test-driven development, is one of the technical practices uh, we've, we've been discussing. Uh, and we started this lecture by actually showing you that it's quite easy to do a bug. So we try to implement a small algorithm that returns the smallest and the largest number. We wrote something like this in Python. We tried one example. Uh, it seemed that it worked. And, but then as soon as we started to think about other cases, we saw that it actually failed. There was a bug in there. And the bug was this very simple else if that should have been a simple if. So these kind of mistakes are quite common, right? Um, this happens in very small examples, but a lot in very complex examples. And that is why we need to do a lot of testing. Uh, we all have made such mistakes before. We did some discussion on this. I told you some personal stories of software that failed, software that I implemented that failed. And the solution for that is simple, right? We just have to test our software. Uh, and But, well, testing our software is not enough. We need to find a way to test the software that is not slow and expensive, that is easy to reproduce, uh, that is not susceptible to failures, and that is not boring. And this is basically manual testing, and that's why we don't like to do it, because it's it, it's just, it doesn't pay off, right? So we need to find a way to automate the tests, uh, meaning we need to write programs that test our programs. And this is quite easy to do. Uh, I introduced you PyTest, the framework that helps us to do this. And what we basically do is we start by writing an example. So we invoke our function, the function we want to test, and then we just make sure that the result is what we expect. So for example, in there, I'm passing numbers in decreasing order. So I invoke find and I pass 29, 28, 27, 26. And I know that for this given input, the result should be 26, the smallest, and 29, the largest. And then I tried just many different test cases, different scenarios. And this is what an automated test is. It's just a program that invokes your function and makes sure that the, the result is what you expect. Then we had some discussion, but well, if I start to write automated tests, I'm gonna be not I'm not gonna be productive because I'm gonna spend lots of my time writing production, uh, sorry, writing test code and not writing production code, which is what really gives um, user uh, value to the user? That is actually not true. Some research shows that um, in medium to long terms, you actually spend less time when you have automated tests because manual testing, they cost you just too much. And funny thing, um, you spend less time debugging because the tests themselves give you so much, so many tips about where your bug is that you have to do less debugging. So you're not spending more money, actually. You're saving money if you're doing automated tests. Uh, then we started to discuss some good ideas. Um, why having a failing test is a good thing. Uh, as soon as you have lots of automated tests, some of them will fail um, when, when, you do, when you write a bug, right? And this is actually a good thing because uh, it fails in your development machine. It didn't fail for the customer and it doesn't cost you money, right? Bugs cost you a lot of money when they happen for your final user. Um, so that is our goal, is to write as many tests as we can, and those tests, they need to fail if there's a bug in the system, right? Good tests are tests that, that fail. Uh, we discussed about the bug cycle, which is the idea that as a developer, uh, whenever I find a bug, uh, I want to write a test to make sure it exists first, and then I fix the bug, and then the test stays there forever. So in a way, this assures us that this bug will never come back because there's a test now and this test will get read if there's a bug. Then some best practices when writing these tests. I discussed the first principles from, uh, from this book. And first F as in fast and our automated tests, they have to be fast, because if they are fast, we can run them all day long. I'm going to program a little bit, I'm going to run, uh, one second later I'm going to get some feedback, I know if everything is working, if not I can fix, and this makes me productive. But if our tests are very slow, meaning I run my test and it takes like 
30 minutes to run, two hours to run. This means I'm not, not going to run them all the time. And I'm not going to have feedback all the time. And this is something we don't like. So whenever you're writing tests, try to make them fast. Isolated uh, is another good practice. So uh, we have many tests, many test methods, and we don't want one test to influence the results of the other. One test should be isolated from the other. Uh, in other words, if I run my entire test suite, the result should be the same as if I run each test individually. And in practice, uh, we see non-isolated tests when the same tests, they um, require the same variables. They make use of the same variables or the same database. Um, this can be quite tricky as soon as you start to, to um, read data and write data. One test can do something that will spoil the other test. So make sure that all the tests are they are responsible for building their, the scenario that they need and that they clean up their mess afterwards. Repeatable. So we don't want tests that are flaky, meaning I want to run my test. And if it is green, if I run it 10,000 10, times again, it will always be green. I don't want tests that are green, green, red, green, green, red, green, green, red, without me changing anything, right? Um, we don't like this kind of test. We call them flaky tests. So if, if you see a test like this, um, try to understand why, why this happens and fix it. Self-validating. So tests should be 100% automated. This means your tests, they need to do assertions at the end. They need to make sure that your program um, worked as expected. You can only do this if you have assertions. This seems very simple, but what happens a lot in practice is that people, they write half of an automated test. They are able to invoke the function and they pass some inputs to the, to the function, but then the assertion part is done manually by a person checking it. And this is not very good. So try as much as possible to make sure that your tests, they do the full cycle. They think they have the scenario you want to test, they exercise the function under test, and then they assert, they make sure that the function behaved as expected. And timely, this is uh, less uh, technical, but more about the social uh, side of software engineering. You should make sure that you're testing, you're, you're writing tests all day long. This has to be something you do continuously. You should not work like two months and then you decide to write tests. This is not going to work. So you have to write tests all the time. Then we went to the idea of test-driven development, which is basically to switch what we do. So instead of implementing and then writing tests, can we write tests first and then implement? And how do we do this? We think about a test, we write a test, we implement the code in the simplest way we can. Uh, and that's what we tried to do with the Roman numerals example. And then we did TDD with the Roman numerals. Uh, I'm not going to do it here, uh, but just what we did was we thought about cases. For example, I should return one. We wrote the test. And then we wrote the implementation and we repeated it. Uh, but then we discussed some things. In the first version, I had this return one that was fixed. And then I used these to discuss baby steps. And TDD tells us to be as simple as we can. And But being simple doesn't mean that this is the best solution possible, right? So uh, we need to, to do baby steps, which is we go step by step. But then if I'm, if I'm feeling safer, I can just take a larger step, right? And this is the advantage of TDD. You can be as uh, big or as small as you want. So when doing TDD, uh, go slow if you're facing something that you don't understand, and you can go a bit faster if you're facing something that you do understand. Refactoring is a fundamental part of TDD as well. So uh, in a lot of opportunities when we were doing TDD, we saw things to improve, like variables to rename, methods to extract, and these kind of things. And you have to do refactoring when you're doing TDD. And this is fundamental. And mostly because when you're focusing on the implementation and to make your test to pass, you're not really thinking about code quality. Uh, code quality happens after you are sure that your program works. And this is also what I like from TDD because it makes me think about the requirements and then write the tests. Then I make it pass. And then as soon as my code is working, I just make it more beautiful. And this is the refactoring step. And also notice that you do the refactoring when the tests are green, which is the perfect time to do it because uh, after you do the refactoring, 
If the tests are still green, this means your refactoring wor worked. But if the tests are red, this means you did something wrong in your refactoring. So this is the TDD cycle. We write a failing test. We see that it fails. We make it pass. We refactor and we repeat. Kent Beck, the creator um, of the TDD term, um, appreciates it. And we saw many advantages, like uh, you're focused on the requirements because the tests are basically the requirements. They're describing the requirements by means of examples, right? You control your pace, you can uh, do baby steps and you can go as fast as you want or as slow as you want. As I said, when I'm insecure, I prefer to go slower. If I'm safe, I, pref I prefer to go fast. We test um, based on the requirements, so everything that we are testing comes from the requirements. Um, and this is a good idea, we're going to see that if you have decent requirements, we can write decent tests. But this is in the future lecture. The tests are our first client, so they are the first piece of code that is actually exercising our software. And this has lots of advantages because it makes us to reflect about the code we are writing. Questions like, is it is it hard to use uh, the function that I'm creating or the class that I'm creating? Uh, is it easy to build it? Does it return what I want it to return? So these kind of questions help you reflect and improve how your functions will look like. Uh, you produce testable code. So if you're writing tests from the very beginning, you're making sure that you're writing code that can be tested. In practice, in legacy systems, we see that things are so coupled to each other that it's quite hard to write tests. And if you're thinking about tests all the time, uh, this is less likely to happen. They are a draft, so you're starting from your tests and then you're thinking about how your class function will look like. And it's quite cheap to change. If you don't like the way you called your function, you can just change it. If you don't like the input parameters you're passing, you can, you can change it. So in a way, there's some sort of draft paper that you use to think about what you're doing. Fast feedback, we've been uh, discussing this. If you have uh, lots of tests and you're doing this in a timely manner, you have feedback all the time. You write a little bit of code and you have feedback from your tests. You write a little bit more code and you have, again, feedback. Controllability, uh, this is about, um, in complex cases, you wanna control things. In a lot of your projects, you had to control the keyboard because you wanna simulate the keyboard to see if a program works or you wanted to simulate um, random numbers, all those kind of things. And if you're thinking about TDD, it is it in a way forces you to think about controllability. How can I control everything so that I can write a very simple PyTest test? Is it effective? There are lots of evidence showing that TDD can be beneficial. Uh, some studies show that you produce more tests, you spend less time debugging, you write less defects, you better use OOP concepts. Uh, but some other studies, of course, they sometimes show that there are no differences um, when people are doing TDD and they are not doing TDD. Um, one of my papers, uh, what, what I discussed in there is that TDD doesn't do magic for you, but it gives you a safe space to think and to refactor constantly. And to me, this is the main effect of test-driven development. Some advices, um, keep a test list, so things that you want to test, keep it there. Refactor both the production and the test code. Always see your test failing at least once. And stop and think frequently, just, just don't go there and program like crazy, okay? TDD 100% of the time. There are no silver bullets, as we've been discussing, right? But And even I don't do TDD 100% of my times. Um, I do TDD when I feel I need it. Uh, for example, if I'm on a case that I don't know how to design my functions, TDD helps me a lot. But what I always do, regardless of doing TDD or not, is that I always write tests. Um, and I never spend too much time only in production. So I, I write a little bit of production and I, I write a little bit of testing all the times, in a timely manner, as the first principles suggest. And this is what we call unit testing. Uh, we've been discussing unit testing a lot. So this is another topic, uh, aside from TDD. Uh, we are testing one unit so far, which is one function. And if you just think about testing the small units of your software, you, you will have advantages, right? So unit, a small part of your software, 
The advantages is that unit tests are very fast. They are easy to control because you can simulate things. They are easy to write. We just wrote a few of them in the lecture in like 30 seconds. But the disadvantage is that they are less real. Uh, some bugs cannot just be reproduced at unit level. They just, happens, uh, they just happen when lots of things are connected together. But to gain more reality, what we can do is go to the other side, which is uh, doing system tests. And in there, we don't care about the small units of our software anymore, but we care about the software, this big black box. And it is my software, and given an input, it says something, and, and I can test my software from this perspective. Advantages, system tests are very realistic because they capture the perspective of the final user, right? It simulates the user uh, in, in, in a real setting, like opening the browser if it's a web application or playing with a mobile application if it's a cell phone application. But a disadvantage is that they are usually slow, they can be hard to write, and they can be flaky. So flaky tests, they pass and they fail, they pass and they fail. Finally, we discussed the testing pyramid, which is we have different levels to test and we can try to think about focusing on different levels. Uh, the testing pyramid suggests you to focus a lot on unit tests because they are easy to do, um, they are cheap to do as we saw, and if you really have small functions, you can be very productive and you can find lots of bugs. But the other levels are also very important, so you can do some integration tests, which is part of your system with an external part of, of your whole um, project, system tests, like your entire software is a black box, and then uh, my personal addition some manual exploratory testing in there because it can be useful as well. The more you go to the top of the pyramid, the more reality you have, but the more complex it is to write the tests. How do I do it? I prefer to test all the business rules of my software as unit tests, all of them. Integration tests for complex integrations that I have. For example, if I'm talking to PayPal, I'm going to test my communication with PayPal. System tests, so seeing my software as a black box, it costs a lot of money, so I do it um, for the main, most important, maybe risky parts of my software. And manual tests, well, avoid it at all costs, but if it is an exploratory testing, uh, there are lots of nice suggestions and books on how to do exploratory testing, then you do it. Uh, but it's a, if it's a manual test, you can automate it, push it to the bottom of, of, of the pyramid. I pointed you to this uh, nice blog post about it. And that was our lecture on, on automated software testing. And I closed this with Martin Fowler's quote, whenever you're tempted to type something into a print statement or a debugger expression, write a test instead, right? So this is more about the timely way of, uh, the timely perspective of the first principles. You should write tests all the time.